Pinga? Pinga? Are you about to see my, my presentation? Oh, you can see it. But I'm not able to move it from my end. Oh, yeah, there it is. So <clears throat> I continue moving <clears throat> it from the other part, from the planet. I can see it from my Kenneth. I don't know what it is. I'm about to see my, my presentation. So you can see it. At the bottom. But I'm not able to move it from my end. Oh, yeah, there it is. So <clears throat> I continue moving it from the other part, from the Kenneth. I can see it from my Kenneth. I don't know what it is. I'm about to see my presentation. Why is the echo? Does it mean that it is slow because I can just hear it? Good morning, uh, class. Um, this is CCS 103 HIV AIDS. Uh, my name is Dr. Ngujiri Josephine. I'll be taking you through this uh, topic. <laughs> Uh, I think I was both on YouTube live and I was on Kenneth live. Sorry, members. So, uh, as I said, my name is Dr. Gojuri Josephine. I'll be taking you through this topic three uh, about a mode of HIV transmission. And uh, you can type your questions on the chat and uh, <clears throat> I can follow them through. So uh, we have the topic three, talking about mode of transmission of HIV and AIDS. And uh, you have been introduced in the previous two lectures on um, really what is the meaning of HIV and what is the meaning of AIDS. And now when we are looking at the transmission, what we have in mind is uh, we are able to conceptualize how the infection moves from one person or rather spread from one person to the other. And with that in mind, we definitely can be able to prevent the spread of the infection. So um, HIV uh, virus is uh, actually a pathogen. Pathogens are disease-causing microorganisms, and uh, with this uh, virus, it, it actually uh, attacks the uh, immune system of a person. So essentially, uh, HIV and AIDS will not uh, kill an individual, but actually the secondary infections. So it, it does fight the CD4 cells of the immune cell. And you are going to find this in our next uh, topic where we'll be talking about the immune system and the virus and how it actually uh, brings the immune system down. Uh, <clears throat> so for the, for the AIDS, that will develop over time. Uh, once the infection has taken place. So it does not um, happen uh, sooner, depending on the status of the immune system. So the status of the immune system is so important in development of any disease. So you will find that we are going to find the various uh, states as we move on. Uh, where we have the host virus relationship. And in here, uh, depending on your immune system, depending on your immune system, you can actually be able to... Uh, uh, 
Ginga. I'll keep on consulting you. Are the slides moving in the YouTube? Ginga? Thank you, thank you, thank you for the confirmation. So we have the three states depending on the immune system, and this is what we are referring to as the host virus relationship. So there are three states depending on how well your immune system is, and uh, also it also depends on um, uh, the pathogen itself. In this case, the virus in question that we are talking about. So we can have three states. Number one, your immune system could be so good and so strong such that in case you are exposed to the virus, uh, then your body will destroy the virus and that state we describe it as a virus destruction, meaning at this point we don't have to worry about anything because your immune system has been able to clear the virus and it has not been able to establish itself in the body. So lucky you. However, uh, in cases where the virus have succeeded in actually entering your system, then we have the other two states. We have a carrier state and we have a disease state. Uh, now, the key thing to note here is that uh, <clears throat> if a person is infected with HIV and AIDS virus, uh, the transmission only occurs if we can actually detect the virus in the blood, and that is what we usually call the detectable load. So if we cannot detect the virus in the system, it also means that you cannot be able to transmit that virus from one person to the other. And that is critical. That is important for us to note because we are going to see under which circumstance do we make this uh, virus undetectable in the system such that uh, the person is not transmitting the virus. Uh, so the, the, the other two states are actually the carrier state. In a carrier state, this is where you have the infection but no symptoms. And I know you have had it uh, along the corridors in the village, uh, people talking about uh, that person and so and so being a carrier. Meaning what? They, they have the, the infection but they are not showing signs and symptoms. And the final state, or rather the final state, is where you have now eventually the disease state. What does it mean? The disease state means that now you are actually exhibiting signs and symptoms. So we can actually tell from the signs and the symptoms that we are, we are observing or you are reporting to us that actually you actually suffering now from the AIDS state or the AIDS stage is the disease stage if you are infected with the virus because we said that this uh, virus will progress over time to um, the, the acquired immune uh, syndrome where your immune system have been attacked. So the immune system, uh, once it have been weakened, then uh, this is the, the when the disease state uh, actually uh, starts exhibiting itself. And actually, there are four main stages uh, with different symptoms. Of course, uh, for you to learn more about these uh, symptoms. We have a resource on our e-learning platform. You can access that and you can see all uh, uh, the signs and the symptoms. I don't want to dwell on them. And if we were able to respond, you could actually tell me uh, the, 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 the signs and symptoms associated with HIV and AIDS, but you can actually do that on the chat. You can put the, the signs and symptoms associated with HIV on the chart. However, even when we have observed the signs and symptoms, they could mean something different. Uh, and this is what we describe as differential diagnosis. 
we may think that it is HIV and AIDS and probably could be another infection, could be probably COVID-19, probably could be a cancer which is developing, probably could be something else because probably it's loss of weight that we have observed, which could have been caused by many other things. And that is why we actually emphasize on diagnosis. I know my group C, we have agreed that we are going to undergo a HIV testing by the time we are finishing this uh, particular <laughs> unit and we'll know our status. We have agreed that if we are negative, we will remain negative and if we are positive, we are going to take our medication and lower our viral load to ensure that we are not spreading the infection to other people, and uh, which is very important for all of us. So for more symptoms, you can actually check on a platform. However, I want to uh, emphasize that even when we suspect that uh, the person could be uh, suffering from this particular viral infection, uh, the definitive um, uh, confirmatory test is actually diagnosis. And diagnosis is very important because uh, then you'll be able to manage the infection for, to, for you to protect your immune system. Because when you take your medication early enough, then your immune system remains stronger for a longer period of time. Remember, this is uh, an illness that will be managed through, throughout your life if you get infected because the medication we have do not actually clear the virus from your system. It does not um, uh, destroy the virus in the system. What it does is that it just keeps the viral load um, uh, lowered so that your immune system can keep on picking and preventing uh, the secondary infections that you could be exposed to, uh, which are actually uh, uh, more serious when, when you have this particular infection. So we have these particular drugs. Um, uh, I will, I'm just going to highlight because in subsequent lectures, we are going to look at them in detail. But it is important for me to highlight them because what we, I said earlier is that uh, if you look at that brethren, that if the viral load is undetectable, then it, the, the virus cannot be transmitted. And that is why it is important that if uh, a person is actually infected, they take uh, the, 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 the medication so as to lower the viral load. So you find that uh, with the uh, medicine, we have the pre-exposure, prophylaxis, which is referred to as PLEP. And this is taken uh, by people uh, if they think they are exposed to actually uh, the HIV uh, AIDS. I remember that in one of the uh, topics, you are told that we have various groups. I think that was the last topic that we looked at last week, that uh, some of the members of the society, depending on what they do, they could be more exposed to uh, this particular infection. And I can remember that uh, sexual workers were the ones who are highlighted as uh, highly exposed. However, uh, the people working in the uh, health sector are also uh, slightly exposed because they are actually uh, handling uh, infected patients and those who are not infected. So definitely they need to take precautionary measures to ensure that they do not come into contact with anything that can actually lead to infection. And we are going to see what we mean here because we are talking about the body fluids in general. Uh, and then we also have post-exposure prophylaxis, APEP, which also is usually uh, recommended for people who have been exposed, probably during uh, maybe a person have been raped, uh, maybe you have been involved in an accident and they were cut. On um, yeah, there was uh, uh, <clears throat> other people who had cut, and probably the blood could have come into contact with the broken skin. So the post exposure 
prophylaxis. So prophylaxis means prevention. So if you see prophylaxis, that is prevention. Pre-exposure means it is before you have been exposed to the infection. And I have given the circumstances that are which probably this is a sex worker who wants to actually prevent themselves from acquiring the infection. However, for the pre-exposure infection, this is not recommended to be uh, the routine of preventing this particular infection because we are going to find that there are actually other ways we can actually prevent, but not uh, taking PrEP every time or pre-exposure prof faces drugs and uh, post-exposure prophylaxis we have given the situations where you are going to find that it is necessary uh, for the person to to be given these uh, uh, drugs uh, after the exposure. I've given one in instance is actually during rape or during an accident where cuts have been uh, uh, or where cuts have occurred due to uh, probably uh, the fragment of the cow, the widow. Then we have the antiviral drugs. These ones, they manage the viral load. The, these are administered or they are recommended when the person is infected. And this one, so for the prophylaxis, they are preventing the infection. And now for the antiviral drugs, the ARVs, these ones are actually uh uh, recommended for persons who are already infected, and these ones they prevent or slows the progression of HIV infection, uh, AIDS, such that your immune system is able to bounce back and fight the secondary infections, not leaving your system so exposed. So that is key. That bullet number three is very key. That undetectable, uh, actually. Uh, translates to uh, uh, untransmissible, uh, that if we cannot detect the viral load, definitely you cannot be able to transmit it from one person to another. So now the actual transmission actually occurs when the pathogen gains access to your system through the mucosa membrane or a broken skin uh, from an infected person. So which are these mucosa membrane? The mucosa membrane, they, they actually are lining, we find in our um, reproductive health, uh, the vagina, uh, we have um, we have the, uh, we have the mucosa membrane on our respiratory system, we have mucosa membrane um, on other parts of the body, digestive system, which is important to protect us from pathogens, including HIV and AIDS virus. So the pathogen, I say, these are diseases causing microorganisms. They could be virus, they could be bacterial in nature, they could be parasitic in nature. But what we are concerned with today is actually HIV and AIDS. So we have the body fluids here. We have number one, blood. We have semen. We have preseminal fluids, vaginal fluids. We have rectal fluids. We have breast milk. So if I just pause there and I just think about uh, the ways in which now a contaminated blood can get through a body, number one, definitely is if we have probably uh, organ um, transplant, blood transfusion, if we are sharing needles for the drug addicts, if we are sharing sharp objects, for example, during tattooing and other, and other processes that would uh, include uh, coming into contact with the blood from one person to the other. Then for the semen, definitely this is uh, the, the the other the other three semen, preseminal fluid, and vaginal fluid. This is definitely through sexual interaction and also rectal fluid. That's during uh, sexual intercourse. So for the for the rectal fluid, uh, for this for this uh, for these two semen and preseminal fluid. 
they could be also at, be attributed to anal sex and uh, vaginal phrase now this can be uh, attributed to uh, sexual intercourse uh depending on uh, the, the the partner so we have the heterosexuals where we have male and female uh, engaging in sexual intercourse and we also have uh, uh homosexuals where we have um uh, uh people engaging uh through sexual intercourse not through the normal way that is expected not through reproductive system but now through the, rec the, the rectum which is the anal region and uh, as i highlighted in one of the groups is that uh for the you are told the other time in the topic too that uh homosexuals are highly exposed to hiv infection this is because the rectum epithelium or the wall of um uh the the, the rectum uh, is not adapted for sexual activity and therefore it is very thin and it can easily be broken remember an intact skin is your first line of defense. So if you have an intact skin, then that means that you are protected, not 100%, but you are highly protected because that becomes your first line of defense. So you find that homosexuals, if uh, they, they are engaging in lect lectome, uh, or rather anal sex, then it means that it is easy to break the rectum uh, skin because it has not been adapted to sexual activity like the vagina has. However, even the vagina can be bruised where it is broken and then we do have the entry of the virus into the system. Then we have the breast milk, and definitely this is one of the contributing factor to mother-to-child transmission. However, I'm told that there is a section of adult population, um, not in, in this country, but in a country that I don't want to mention, uh, where the um, one, one group of... Uh, uh, the society is actually craving for the breast milk. So uh, apart now from mother to child, then we can visualize breast milk also contributing to actually infection in adult population. Uh, and um, th that, that is a, a real debate. Uh, which I wouldn't want to engage in at the moment. Uh, so when does the transmission really occur? The transmission occurs when parties involved are not using uh, barrier protection, for example, for those ones that are uh, actually uh, engaging in sexual activities. Um, uh, definitely when we can detect the viral load. And if I go back to the other slide, the, the, uh, <clears throat> I have highlighted the, the other ways in which we can come into contact with this body frayed. So if, if they have the, the viral load that can be detectable, then it means that definitely uh, the infection can be spread from one person to the other. So in case of um, uh, sexual engagement or sexual intercourse, uh, if a person or the parties who are involved are not using a cordon, and uh, at this juncture, uh, I know that I, I have said this in, in one of the groups that we actually have the cordons light left center in the university uh in the radius washrooms the codons are there in the gentlemen washrooms the codons are there they are basically not for preventing only pregnancy but we really want to ensure that uh we curb the spread of hiv and aids 
amongst ourselves. So that's why we have a quorum supplied in plenty. And even in our hostels, we have, but we do not recommend sexual engagement in our hostels. So check laws and regulations for our hostels. However, the codoms are available. And I ask who should carry a codom, uh, the man or the woman in question in this case. Of course, that is something you should answer by now. However, I want to say that everybody should carry a codom, whether you uh, the male partner or the female partner, bring them on the table. Let us now start discussing uh, which one are we going to use first if we must engage in sexual intercourse uh, before marriage. Because again, we recommend abstinence, but however, uh, one of the groups told me that se sexual intercourse is a basic need. <laughs> <laughs> I have not been able to verify that, but I leave that at that. Um, I think that discussion that we can keep on having. And then we have taking pre-exposure prophylaxis. I talked about that. And then uh, when the, the, uh, <coughs> if you do not take pre-exposure prophylaxis and uh, you are infected, then you are going to transmit the virus to sorry if if you you are not going to take pre-exposure prophylaxis and you are not infected and you are engaging in sexual activities with somebody who is infected then definitely you are going uh, to end up having the infection uh, gain access to your system uh, then we have the viral load when it is very high and can be detected that is when actually the transmission will come and the NB have said that if the viral load is very low, it cannot be detected in the blood or the, the fluids that are in question that we have talked about. It cannot be, the viral load cannot be detected in the blood, in the semen, in preseminal fluid, in vaginal fluid, in the rectal fluid, in breast milk. Then it means that the transmission cannot occur, which is good news for us. So <clears throat> particularly, it is very important to ensure that the viral load remains uh, very, very low. So uh, having given you the background, those are the main modes of transmission, sexual transmission uh, through sharp objects, blood transfusion, mother to child. So for the sexual transmission of HIV, um, this is where we have the sexual activities. Uh, we have the heterosexual, where male and female engage in sexual uh, activities, uh, mainly vaginal sex, and uh, this would result into uh, the fluids in question, which are there, the semen, vaginal, and cervical secretions. Uh, and then we have homosexual, and this is where you have men having sex with men and mainly the anal sex. And I have explained why the exposure is higher uh, in this category of uh, members of society. Number one is because the rectal, uh, uh, um, the rectal uh, wall is thin and have not been adapted for sexual activities. Uh, number two, we agreed that definitely um, for homosexuals, because of the stigma associated with the relations, um, there is um, the tendency not to open up. And also, it is not easy to target them in the management of HIV and AIDS. Because, for example, if you look at the heterosexual uh, sexual engagement, we know who we are targeting. Probably we are targeting married couples who probably one, one person have uh, the infection and the other person is not infected, what we refer to as discordant couples. And uh, then the other for heterosexual could be uh, the sex workers. 
So because we already know they are highly exposed and they don't shy away from, you know, uh, the, the where they are going to work and to 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 actually uh, to actually exhibit that well I'm in this profession I'm sexual worker so it is easier to target them because you know where you can find them you can find them in the bars you can find them in the streets you can find them um, in various uh part of probably town or some rural areas where you know they congregate and then it will be easier to talk to them, create awareness, provide prophylaxis and all that. But for homosexuals, uh, this is a vice that will, uh, okay, um, maybe I should not put it like that. Uh, this is an engagement that will um uh, go on in really secretive uh, places and hidden and nobody wants actually to be known. However, you find that homosexual men, they all have women who they are engaging in sexual activities with. So it becomes very tricky. Uh, for example, uh, a husband who never wants the wife to know that they are homosexuals. Uh, a boyfriend will never want to know or, or would not want uh, to even imagine the girlfriend realizing that, well, I am a homosexual. So it remains a very secretive engagement where you find that because of the societal expectations, they would still relate with the opposite sex. However, they are having a sexual engagement with other men and all sex, meaning that they are highly, really exposed to the infection. But now due to societal expectation, they also get into heterosexual relations uh, and, and therefore exposing their partners to uh, this kind of uh, um, transmission of HIV and AIDS. However, you also find that uh, in a heterosexual um, relations, you also find that we could be having people who are having multiple partners, which also exposes them. Uh, to HIV and AIDS infection uh, because now you don't know the other partner who they are engaging with and who have left them. So the cycle continues and it is unfortunate that um, uh, innocent uh, people who are faithful in their relations, they may end up being infected and uh, that is why we, we, we are talking about uh, uh, some hygiene in uh, these relationships where if you, you're having multiple partners, uh, know your status, use a codom, uh, make sure that you take a, a pre prophylaxis if you have been a, exposed and you had not taken any precautionary measures, make sure you take a uh, prophylaxis, which is very important. We have the other group which may be engaging in oral sex. And uh, oral sex here, remember, we are still talking about now the... Uh, the men and priests, the men of freed. And then we also have saliva. However, saliva does not have high level of concentration of the viral load. So you usually find that for the saliva, the, the load is usually undetectable. And saliva, that's why we are not even highlighting it uh, as much because it is not a fluid which is really associated uh, with actually HIV transmission. However, if 
the person who is infected have a wound in the mouth, then in that case, there could be blood contamination with saliva and that could lead to higher loads of the virus and subsequently then that would lead to the transmission of the virus in that way. And that is why you find probably pecking may not um, lead to a transmission of the virus, but probably deep kissing where the infected person have a wound and also have high uh, viral load, then that means that the, the, the transmission can actually occur. Then we have the digital sex. And this digital sex is mainly associated with women who use the, the vibrators and then they share these vibrators. So in the sharing, in the sharing, then what happens is that we have the vaginal and cervical secretions uh, moving uh, from one person to the other. Um, and, and the media is the vibrator. The media will be the vibrator. And uh, <clears throat> definitely that uh, would also lead to uh, the transmission of the virus. So that is the sexual transmission. I think we have looked at um, most of the, the transmission in uh, relation to sexual activities. We can go to the transmission through infected blood and blood products. And this is uh, described as parental. And number one, we have the transfusion of infected blood or blood products. So due to the process of transfusion, if the blood have not been proper, proper, uh, properly screened, then it means the recipient can actually acquire the infection during that process. And that means what? It means that if the blood donor was infected and during the process of transfusion, the blood was not screened, then it will mean that the recipient can actually uh, uh, acquire the infection during the transfusion. Then we have donated organs, which definitely will mean that we have uh, uh, with the, with the donated organs. Uh, if we have uh, um, the infection, you know, the, this organ is living, so it will have the remnants of blood from the donor. And that way, if the donor was infected, uh, then it also means that there are very high chances that the recipient will also acquire the infection. Then we have exposure to infected blood or, or body fluids through contaminated sharp objects. Uh, and now this is quite interesting because we can see that uh, this sharp objects are actually used in various processes and these processes include uh, the traditional practices and for example uh, if we look at that number one the needle sharing uh, under which circumstances would you share a needle uh, maybe i look at a setup where probably we have a person probably with a giga free and uh, they want to remove that jugger free and they are using a needle, then they may share the needle. Uh, and I wish other circumstances would you share a needle if the, uh, we have uh, the, uh, the drug uh, addict using the injectable drugs. Now, out of that, under that uh, particular scenario, you will have that a person will use their needle and then probably they, they, have, they have a specific dosage. Uh, maybe you take 10 ml, 
then one person wants to use 5 ml, then the other one wants to use 5 ml. And uh, when you are under the influence of the drug, you are not even thinking about HIV and AIDS. So you find that these people will uh, are likely to just use the needles anyhow, uh, even when there is lem remnant of blood in the syringe, they are likely to use uh, those needles. And uh, in that way, the, the, the person who is actually not infected and sharing a needle uh, uh, used by somebody who was infected, then it means they are actually exposed and they could be infected through that route. Uh, then we have the traditional practices. And these pra traditional practices, they have been there for ages. Uh, number one, we have ovarectomy. And ovarectomy, this is where you, you actually remove the ovra. And what is ovra? Ovra is a... Is a mm, is is uh, something in uh, inside your mouth uh, around the throat which does not serve any specific function and i know you have gone through that experience when you you are requested to um, probably somebody want to inspect your mouth you are told to just just actually open your mouth a mouth wide open and bring your tongue forward and uh, up to where you can actually see that is where we have the oeuvre and that 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 is a traditional practice that have continued over the years because it comes with some beliefs i don't know if it is not removed it will broke the throat at one point i don't know so I don't know how true is that, or you'll be continuously having respiratory infection. And uh, probably some of us have undergone through that. And uh, it is usually done in a very ugly version. This is where uh, <laughs> somebody comes uh, and then another one restrains you, and then you go to open your mouth wide open, and after that, you are given something to uh, to make you happy. I don't know, a, a soda or something, and a, a bread, a very dry bread to ensure that you, your throat have been cleared. So I don't know why it is still, because there is no medical justification of this particular process. I don't know why still it has continued in the society silently. That is one way. If if uh, the 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 razor blade uh, or the sharp object being used to remove the ovra is shared among infected and non-infected persons, it will mean that non-infected persons are exposed to the virus and definitely they could be infected. Then sharing of the skin piercing instruments, probably uh, this is very common. Uh, with the with the ladies, but also with men, when it comes to the number three and number five processes, uh, scarification and scarification. This is where you 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 actually uh, put permanent scars on your body, uh, and they will take longer to heal compared to tattooing. So remember tattooing. Tattooing, once you have the scar, that scar, there is a ink. There is additional of ink, yeah, permanent ink. So that is the difference between sacrification and tattooing, where you find that actually uh, for the tattooing, there is a, an ink that, that is involved, but for the, the, the sacrification, this is where uh, only the scar will be left on the part of the body, depending on which pattern the person wants, depending on um, how they want to do it, on which part of the body they want to actually do it. And I know you you have seen them in the in our communities. Uh, and then we have the female genital mutilation. And when I'm talking about female genital mutilation, probably I would also want to think about male circumcision. 
But uh, why are we not putting male circumcision here? Because for male circumcision, something which is embraced in the society and it is highly regulated and you find that it is carried out uh, these days in hospitals and even when it is carried out there traditionally, you find that because it is not something people are shying away from, uh, there is a likelihood that the instruments that are used are actually uh, not per se unhygienic and not shared among persons. However, there are still those instances when they would be shared, but very unlikely and uncommon. However, if that is happening, you can always type on the chat and we can know whether in your community that is a real problem when it comes to uh, circumcision, male circumcision. Now, female genital mutation, why are we really talking about it here is because, again, just the way I, I said that uh, homosexuals, this is something that is not embraced by the society. It is something that is being uh, done in uh, secretive uh, ways and places, and people don't want to be known. And uh, uh, you also find that it is done in crude ways, and uh, <clears throat> the hearing process is also not uh, governed properly because um, we actually believe it should not be happening in the first place because it predisposes uh, the, the, the female to many other uh, problems when it comes to, reproduct to pro re reproductive health. However, you find that some communities are still practicing it. Um, and uh, it is unfortunate because the recent case I had was actually being practiced in uh, uh, in in where I think in Bukurini, where the parents were also actually involved, and uh, it came to be known because actually I think one of the girls died, or there was extensive uh, breeding that was taking place. So you find that you only come to learn about these things when. Uh, uh, things go south. But ordinarily, because it is not something that is being expected to be happening in our community, so it is something that have been shunned in the community and the government is very focal that it is not helping us in any way and it should be stopped. So you find that uh, it is not recommended and therefore people will hide while uh, practicing that. So uh, there is a, an NB there that tattooing can uh, actually be as a result of shared ink or con contaminated equipment because we have differentiated tattooing from sacrification. Sacri sacrification, we have said this is where the you expose part of your body to a scar, permanent scar, depending on why you are doing it. But for the tattooing is different. We have the ink in question. Uh, then we have maternal, uh, rather mother-to-child transmission. And uh, this can uh, occur uh, if the mother is not Adam ALV. And that is why it is very important that we encourage uh, pregnant mothers to actually go for antenatal uh, clinics for specific health care because the first thing uh, that is usually uh, done is actually a HIV uh, testing so that you can manage uh, the mother during the pregnancy. Remember, we have talked of prevention, prophylaxis. <laughs> Sorry, and we have said that if the viral load is undetectable, then it definitely means that uh, the the <clears throat> it definitely means that the the virus cannot be transmitted. That is why we want to keep the viral load 
during pregnancy as low as possible. Now, to avoid what? Transplacental uh, transmission during pregnancy and then also during labor and delivery and also during breastfeeding. And that's why you find that a mother who is HIV positive can actually deliver HIV negative baby, can also breastfeed, and uh, the baby will be HIV negative. But there is the management that goes into it, uh, which is very important for both uh, antenatal and postnatal uh, care for these mothers, and very important. And the other thing we emphasize when we are thinking about mother to child is delivery in the hospital for the purpose of management of this infection during labor and during delivery. So delivery in hospital, very important to ensure that we actually reduce uh, this rate. And there we have the percentages uh, depending on the mode of transmission, the key mode of transmission remaining sexual intercourse. We have seen the various uh, sexual activities that lead to the 70 to 80%. We have mother to child transmission. We have blood transfusion uh, at three to five percent uh, at uh, number that should be number four because also injection drug use ties with mother to child uh, transmission again at five to ten percent, and then we have health caregivers. Uh, where we have uh, people working in the health sector because they are taking care of both infected and non-infected uh, patients. They are slightly exposed, but you can see the percentage is minimal. Unfortunately, it also does occur, and it is quite unfortunate, just like we had Doctors die of COVID, uh, contracted uh, in their line of duty. Uh, even with HIV and AIDS, it also happens that you can actually uh, uh, acquire the infection uh, during uh, the time you are taking care of the patient. So that actually brings us to the end of our topic three today. We have more resources. Uh, I can't be able to see any particular question because what I'm seeing on the chat on the YouTube platform is getting you loud and clear. Mm, that is who Dennis Muteria, uh, Faith Cherutich, is saying what? Nothing. Uh, Karen is saying in our community, FGS is no longer available. <laughs> Thank you, Karen, for confirming that. That is good news. Good to know. Uh, Mary Duku, it is clear now. I don't know what time, but bro. Ah, this is Anthony Mwangi. Now, what are you talking about? I thought you were asking a question. Let me see who is asking a question again. Uh, uh, yeah, Vincent and Amwambia, Chana Nakat, Tunasoma, uh, Faith and Asema, in your timetable, Daniel, in Asema, Unafa Kukuma. <laughs> now, I was thinking, I was responding to questions. Uh, why can we get the notes are already on e platform, Dennis Mwangi, you can get them there. Marimu, thank you for the lesson. You're welcome. Uh, uh, sad, you <laughs> You people, what are you asking on the chat? I'm I'm waiting for a question. What are the pred uh, don't go go go? Let me go back. What are the predisposing? Let me see that. Yeah, this is important. James 
Moluki James is asking, what are the predisposing factors of HIV? Very, very interesting question. And uh, the predisposing factors are the, the ones that are going to be covered in subsequent uh, lectures. So, Moruki, be on the lookout of our subsequent lectures. But, of course, some of them is uh, the economic activities. We have uh, also the female are more exposed to uh, HIV because of their reproductive health morphology. Uh, <clears throat> compared to their male counterparts. Uh, and of course, then we have said the, the economic activities, the sexual workers are more exposed, but we are going to cover this more in our subsequent topics. Uh, let me see if, uh, are we going to sign? Yes, you should proceed to your respective um, uh, groups after this. So, uh, be on the lookout. However, for the group C, we are not going to meet today. So we are going to meet next week. Uh, when is the cut? Uh, the cut um, the cut will be announced and we are going to to give the details, the venues where you are going to see your car from and the time. So be on the lookout. We are going to make that announcement in our subsequent uh, lessons. Other names don't appear. How are we supposed to go about it? Which names and where? Say Zippy. Uh, we, we, we actually recommend that when you are signing in, you sign in with your official name. <laughs> because now, say Zippy, I don't know uh, where, where the names are. Or you mean when you are signing here? I don't know. Uh, maybe uh, Shinga. Are you about to answer that? Other names don't appear. How are we supposed to go about it? I don't know whether it is on this platform. Kinga, you can hear me? Kinga, are you able to answer that? Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 go on. Sorry, uh, I I was I have I had clients. So um, what was the question? <laughs> the question is uh, some some of the students are saying that their names are not appearing. I don't know whether it is in the so YouTube have, platform because uh, others are not able to put their registration number and the the name. Um, uh, for them to be able to. Um, more or less uh, use their uh, or their names appearing directly once uh, they go mm -hmm. into the YouTube. Uh, that mm -hmm. means that they have to have their um, student email as the primary email on their devices. Mm -hmm. That will automatically mm -hmm. pick uh, their the, the names and their admission numbers. But uh, I know mm -hmm. most of them have their personal email as the primary email. And that's mm -hmm. why it's appearing like that. Okay, okay. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I'm sure they are well guided. So if you're still confused, you can get uh, in touch with uh, Shinga. will help you. Uh, then we have another question from uh, Carol, uh, which says, which are the circumstances when a child to be born HIV negative and the mother is HIV positive? I have said is when the mother have managed the viral load during pregnancy by going uh, or visiting uh, the antenatal clinic for proper management and advice. And then they are put under the ALRV so that the viral load continues to be undetectable in the mother. Remember, Carol, we have said that as long as we cannot detect the viral load, then the transmission will not take place. Okay? So that is the... Uh, uh, under the circumstance when the child to be born HIV negative and the mother is actually HIV positive. Yes, it is under that management that I have explained. Uh, group A and EP, uh, check, Moriuki James, people should check their timetable. Where are you scheduled for the actually uh, CCS 103? That, then that is where you go. 
uh, prep wanaume pia hutumia uh, prep eh hey, it is for both gender prep is for both gender ama kwa mremi men can yeah <laughs> and they can also be exposed to hiv uh, aids so uh, they are, they can also use prep if they are having multiple partners how can breastfeeding a baby be affected by the disease how can breastfeeding a baby be i'm not sure what lily um victor you want to ask uh, i've not been able to get your question properly how can breastfeeding a baby be affected by the disease okay I'm not sure I'm getting your question clearly. However, I have said breastfeeding. If you are breastfeeding, you should be also be under ARV management to ensure the viral load is undetectable so that in the milk there is no uh, transmissible uh, load. Uh, in that way, then uh, the, the, the baby will breastfeed. And breast, breast milk is very important because this is where the immune system of the baby is actually built from in the initial days uh as the as they are form for marie where is grouping meeting Allah. this one have not been attended in class yeah. the, these people were asking where they're meeting <laughs> they, this means that they have not been attending the classes one asked, what is the main purpose for alvs marine boosting immunity or making the virus weaker? <laughs> not boosting the immunity ARVs are for reducing the viral load so that uh, your immune system is able to 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 go back to you know a state of normalcy okay so ARVs are not for boosting immunity they are for lowering the virus because virus your immune system so when the load is as low as possible then your immune system is able to flourish okay and then you are able to respond to secondary infection aha uh -huh. chadra asks us uh, to a child to a child feed from different milk because maybe mother maybe a mother is hiv positive can develop stronger or weaker i don't know <laughs> what what you really mean chadra like to a child feed from a different milk <laughs> now do mean goat milk cow milk okay well i i have given a circumstances where we recommend breastfeeding because the mother load is still very low uh, the mother cannot transmit the infection however uh we have we have seen that now in pumwani hospital uh hiv negative mothers are donating the breast milk because we highly believe in the breast milk because of its uh, high potential in protecting the baby uh, during the initial days so um uh the milk it will depend on the status of the the, the baby's immunity but any other milk cannot be compared to a human blessed milk that's why we recommend breastfeeding. I have a problem with my ear problem. What can I do? Please visit our IT department, Salam, and you'll be assisted. Maybe I'm proposing that Zoom is the best dog. Is it possible, please? Um, Zoom is not able to host all of you. And now that we are done with this, we are going to our respective uh, groups where we'll do uh, actually uh, more activities with our respective lecturers. So here we have a, a common uh, platform. And then if you have more questions, which I can see they are still coming in, we have an opportunity to engage on our e-learning platform. And we also have an opportunity to engage with our lecturers now when we go to our respective groups so zoom we are not using zoom because it is not hosting all of you at the same time but uh with with the with the youtube we are able to have all of you at the same time so that you hear 
what I am saying, all of you at the same time, for harmony. Yeah? So we still want to retain our YouTube and then we can have other interactions in other platforms. Please, where can we have the same questions concerning this unit in our respective uh, in our respective uh, groups and on our e-platform. So if you go to our e-platform, I will also be able to answer your question from there after this. Um, let me see the other question. Uh, no, this is perfect for Zoom has got minimal not to... Hey, I agree with the... With the this is... Ooh with bridget yes i agree with bridget yes this is better yes so we prefer youtube <laughs> i can blood group make one one not get hiv no although uh there are some uh, uh blood groups which are uh, uh, uh say to offer minimal protection but not protection per se so i wouldn't want to encourage you that if you are this uh, if your blood is this group then uh, we, we 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 are telling you you are safe no madam had to judge you to soma ccs one one what is the reason how to jack to kisoma ccs one one ala well if it okay uh, I, I will escalate that to the relevant person. <laughs> so I will, I will send that question. Um, yeah, and probably the, the lecturer in the next lesson will be able to answer you, Faith. I'm not sure um, what could be the reason. I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know whether you have missed the platform or something. I couldn't tell faith, but I'm going to follow it up for you. Uh, then for the okay, I think thank you for the clarification. At what minimum age should one use PP or prep? Canada, <laughs> Canada will keep this PP. Uh, yes, they, 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 we have the AFEs that are designed for the children management, but I don't think they are exposed yet. <laughs> but uh, we always have the management for all the age spectrum. In the case you are involved in sex act with an, with an unaffected person and you realize within 72 hours, can you prevent? It's important you, you visit the health uh, center and then they will guide you because the prep should be taken as soon as possible uh, not waiting for 72 hours if it is uh, during rape act or during an accident it should be taken as soon as possible uh, um, how can you treat one of the family members who is HIV positive as normal as possible don't stigmatize them. Don't discriminate. I have a friend whom I just learned the other day that actually is HIV positive. And um, he's still my friend and I treat him as normal as possible because uh, you cannot uh, get infected by shaking hard. Uh, you cannot get infected by sharing a meal unless <laughs> you, you, you are using uh, knives and forks to cut your mouth. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> and you are, then you are sharing that, which is impossible. So treat them as normal as possible. Don't discriminate them. Show them love and acceptance so that we can reduce the stigma associated with HIV and AIDS. Meaning group C are not going to sign the attendance list because you will not be there. Uh, um, uh, um, we'll sign next week. I'm going to hospital. So group C, we are not meeting at the moment. Uh, I'm unwell, so I'm rushing to hospital at the moment after this. But uh, we'll catch up next week. Uh, can you help us? We have not been able to register the unit, just for uh, ICT uh, fraternity. I know Shinga is uh, seeing these questions and 
he will be able to answer. Supposed to have tutorials today, but no lecture is coming in since we start this semester. This is CCS 101. I have picked that, Kevin. Uh, I'm going to escalate it to the relevant personnel. I think we we'll stop there. If you have other questions, you can ask them on the e platform. Uh, let me see if there is uh, any uh, any other burning question. What what about Group B, Madam? Uh, just check, uh, Joyce. Just check your. Uh, just check what. Just check um, uh, your timetable, and then you'll be able to see uh, where you slotted. Where you are slotted. Uh, are we to meet with our respective rooms immediately? Depending on your timetable, yeah. Uh, will the last content on HIV really be tested in the cut as it seems to be a bit complicated? <laughs> will the last content on HIV 103 really be tested in the cut? Ruben, now which content is complicated? <laughs> uh, everything that we are teaching it, it will be tested. So, uh we are not only uh testing what is simple so uh if it is complicated come and then i'll break it down to you to what circumstances and uh, which a newborn child should be safe from a mother who is infected i explained that uh, uh just help us the uh, economics that is to mind <laughs> Goodness. Oh my. Some some are streaming from home. <laughs> this thing of signing on another is us. <laughs> Just make sure that you don't only come to sign, Luna. Uh we, we also have clarifications we make and we we give you a platform to interact further. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry, guys. So I think we can now uh, add this and meet in our respective groups. <laughs> it was a pleasure having you on board. Um, keep on uh, engaging me on uh, e-learning platform. <clears throat> and uh, we, we, we'll keep tabs. So if thank you, thank you, thank you for the quick recovery wishes. Um, uh, see you soon. Bye. I know they usually have online classes on Monday. And they usually two groups, it's online.